Hello and welcome to D Infinity Live, the never duplicated, always complicated, slightly perturbated. That's a real word. Look it up. Uh, gaming webcast. Uh, I am your host, William Big T Thrasher. With me, as always, is Michael Jolly Varhola, Brandon, slightly less jolly Cass, and special guest Clint Staples. Hello, gentlemen. Hey. Evening. And tonight, our topic is swords and sorcery, a genre that is very, very near and dear to all of our hearts. But before we dive into the meat of that topic, we do have some things to talk about. Uh, right off the bat, uh, Mike, what is going on with our co-publisher, Skirmisher? Well, uh, it has been, uh, I think, somewhat more than a month since we've come out with a new release, mostly because we've been getting ready for, for Comic Palooza and working on a number of projects. But we uh, released... Yesterday, uh, a revised and expanded version of our famous H.G. Wells' Little Orc Wars. And basically, Little Orc Wars is a fantasy spin-off of H.G. Wells' Little Wars. So it is a miniatures game that is played over as big of a floor space as you can get for it. Uh, and most combat is resolved with live catapult fire. Uh, and it's set up so that you can use it with any of your favorite models or, or miniatures. Uh, especially ones you don't mind getting stepped on or shot with catapults. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to be um, uh, running this game. Uh, uh, we run it only at one convention because the setup for what we do is so big um, that, that uh, we, we can't do it very often. But we're going to be running a 900-square-foot Little Orc Wars game at Comic Palooza. So anyone who can't make it to Comic Palooza, check out the new rules uh, at Drive Through RPG. We expanded them from 24 to 54 pages uh, and cleaned up what was already up there. So uh, uh, anybody can can check that out. And if you're going to be at uh, Comic Palooza, come by and see our huge demo game in the Skirmisher Game Pavilion. Very very cool. And uh, Brendan, what is going on with our website d-infinity.net? Well, Clint, who's joining us, uh, details all of the effort that he's put into uh, preparing for uh, Comic Palooza, that of course being the big event on all of our minds. Uh, the event listing uh, for Comic Palooza, all the things that Skirmisher and D Infinity are going to be doing at that convention is right there, prominent up top on the front page. Uh, that piece of content is even more important now. The uh, event listing will not be in print at the convention, so you won't see it. Uh, you won't have the full event catalog. Like. Right, not the full event catalog. So um, if, if you want the full event listing, you're going to have to go to... Um, You'll have to you'll have to you'll have to go to the blog post. That, that's they, thank you, Will. Um, <laughs> froze there for a second, and then of course we've got more uh, fun monsters from uh, very sci-fi movies written by uh, Chris Van Dielen uh, for uh, the um, uh, 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 Mutant Future game system. Yeah, uh, I am space today. He stands for basic system. So that's anybody. Right. Who Playing any version of basic system, right. can use this stuff as is, and really, it's it it's all the same stuff that you see in OGL or Pathfinder. Basically, he stats the stuff so you can pick it up and plug it into any D right. D and D based system uh, since the version that was played in 1979. Very, very cool. And I know we've all we've all got a lot of different things going on at uh, Comic Palooza. Mike, what are some of the events you're going to be doing? That's right. We're all going to be at Comic Palooza, all four of us, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. Uh, what have I got going on at Comic Palooza? Um, I am ultimately the one that has been uh, the point of contact with Comic Palooza for all of the events that, that we're all mutually running. So, in short, uh, I've been organizing and uploading our 40 gaming events. We're doing 40 gaming events. Uh, we're going to be running the Skirmisher Game Pavilion and D-Infinity's Pavilion of Many Games, which is basically going to be us running ongoing gaming for 10 to 12 hours a day every single day of the con. So if people come up to the Skirmisher Game Pavilion, which is going to be our own uh, breakout room uh, next to the main gaming area, we will be running games there uh, the entirety uh, of the convention. Uh, as long as the exhibit hall is open, 
we will have games going there. So our card and board games from the Infinity, new fresh stuff that you have developed, Will, uh, some stuff that uh, Clint has been putting a lot of work into, uh, demo games of our own skirmish system. Um, we're going to be running dozens and dozens of games. So that's one thing I've been doing, and then I also run the um, paranormal track for Comic Palooza. I'm the editor of the America's Haunted Road Trip series of travel guides, uh, so we're going to be doing a dozen paranormal panels, pub crawls, presentations, uh, mostly about ghost hunting, but but also uh, things tying in with cryptids and X creatures and, and that. Uh, and we do a scavenger hunt, uh, and we host the Saturday night party. Um, we run a huge exhibit booth. We're going to have a four... Uh, a four booth sized exhibit area. We're going to have a 20 by 20 exhibit area. So um, we will have a lot going on at Comic Palooza. And Clint, uh, you, you were during the pre show prep, you actually showed us something that you had prepared that ties into one of your events for Comic Palooza. Yeah. Uh, well, much of my waking life for the last three weeks or so has been putting together. The rules and uh, all the the, pre the parts, the working parts that I'm going to need to run Saga of the Worm Sun, which is a two-part uh, set of scenarios for uh, the Chebuchet rules from Skirmisher Publishing. And so, uh, as I uh, mentioned in the in my blog, Chebuchet is intended for uh, uh, recreating uh, historical uh, skirmishes from the Hundred Years' War. I don't have any figures for that, uh, so. I decided that uh, I would use the figures that I had, which unfortunately, because I'm a professional, professional sculptor but not a professional painter, haven't been painted or hadn't been. So I painted up a bunch of miniatures and put together a bunch of terrain. And uh, one of the pieces, the piece that you referred to, is a Viking long haul, uh, longhouse, uh, about 14 inches long and seven or eight inches in height. So that'll be the centerpiece for uh, one of the two scenarios. That, 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 that's pretty awesome. But, you know, beyond that, I mean, you said basically, well, you're going to be running the Chevrochet rules using uh, the miniatures that you've got rather than the miniatures you don't got. But you're being too modest. You also uh, came in up with a uh, plug-in rule system for using sorcerers with the Chevrochet system. Uh, you uh, brought in uh, Norse mythological creatures like trolls and half-trolls. You've got a werebear in your scenario. So you, you've really gone way beyond just using the miniatures you've got. You've done some really, really fun, innovative things that is just going to make this a great scenario. Well, I hope it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I welcome, uh, I, I invite anybody who's listening to, uh, uh, who's planning on coming to Comic Palooza to uh, join me and uh, push some figures around. Um, so hopefully uh, people will have as much fun as, as I had so far making stuff. So, And that's, that's a lot of it for us as game designers, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Getting ready for the game. We, we, we release just as many endorphins as, as uh, our players do when they actually play the darn game. That's, that's right. right. Yeah. Well, if we, if we weren't enjoying ourselves on some level, we wouldn't be doing it. Right. Well, that's right. true. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Brendan, any, any uh, big plans you have for Comic Palooza? Uh, well, uh, beyond uh, managing the, the game pavilion, I will uh, be uh, uh, holding a, uh, a, a, a chat on uh, BookForge. Oh, and, cool. Uh, things right. that we've uh, got going on with BookForge, what it's going to look like in the future, uh, why people should be excited about it and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and then bartending the party. <laughs> That's right. So, so you're managing the game pavilion, uh, acting as the bartender for the official skirmisher party, and talking about our newest web developments. This this makes you a renaissance man, Brendan. Right. That's right. I'd say I do all of them about uh, equally well. <laughs> you're like Thomas, if Thomas Jefferson was a nerd, that would be you. And uh, I'm gonna, uh, Brendan. I'm gonna go ahead and put in my drink order now, uh, so you can start working on it. I would like a dry Manhattan. That's fine. I make a very good Manhattan. Marvelous. And I guess, uh, so speaking on my own behalf, uh, I've got uh, four Cthulhu Live events. We're doing one Cthulhu Live event a day. Uh, the Ageless uh, Return of Cyrus Crane. Uh, we've got some old old uh, scenarios that tie into the Old West. I'm also going to be running a lot of tabletop. I've got a Savage Worlds event uh, beneath the Mountains of Madness. Uh, I've got... Uh, 
an OGL event, which uh, combines, actually combines swords and sorcery with the Cthulhu mythos, uh, mm -hmm. the lair of the sleeping god. So I am going to be very, very busy, in addition to the Game Pavilion stuff, in addition to the stuff at the booth, in addition to networking, in addition to uh, keeping spirits up at the party. Uh, so, yeah, I think we're all going to be... We're going to be running pretty ragged by the end of the show, but it's going to be oh, the yeah. best kind of exhaustion. We, we, we run hard at this. Uh, and, you know, I was talking to one of our associates who said something like, well, you know, I mean, how many hours do you expect me to work? You know what? Uh, the standard for us is not how many... How many hours do we expect you to work? Uh, this is what we're there for. Uh, we're not there to um, cravenly wait in line for three hours to give some celebrity $80 so that we can buy his, his autograph. This is not what we go to these shows for. Uh, we got four days uh, to, to show off our games and show off our best work and entertain people and, and get people involved in everything that we're doing. Spread our message. Uh, we're not there to sort of shamble around and, and look at the show. We're there to run the show. We're there to be part of the show. Uh, so, um, yeah, how many hours do I expect you to work? Uh, Any time that uh, you have not passed out in a corner from exhaustion or need to eat something to keep uh, your physical functions going, uh, you know, keep it moving. That's what we're there for. Uh, the clock starts ticking when we get there, and it stops uh, when the show's over. Uh, we've got a finite period to make it happen. Yep. And uh, speaking of finite periods, I think it is about time we got into our main topic, which is swords and sorcery. Both of them? Uh, We're from both? Pardon that? We're talking about both swords and sorcery tonight. Bo both at the same time. Wow. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, th this this is this is an awesome topic. I've been waiting to get to this since we started doing the show. Lo, those many years ago. Uh, but uh, before before we get going, I guess we you know just for for people who don't know, uh, we ought to explain what sword and sorcery uh, means to us. And Mike, I know you've actually lectured on sword and sorcery, and uh, being being from Texas, which is often considered the birthplace of swords and sorcery, you've actually got some very specific stuff you wanted to to the audience about. Yeah, uh, I, I won't talk too much because I have a tendency to talk too much. Uh, but I'll say that um, we could talk about the difference of what makes swords and sorcery a distinct subgenre. Uh, but swords and sorcery, I would say, uh, tends to be, um, and anyone can object when they when they uh, can say something different when they give their definition. But I'd say it tends to be um, a gritty, somewhat dark, uh, often dark. Uh, Character-driven subgenre of uh, fantasy. Uh, so it's it's very character-driven. It tends to be gritty. It tends to be dark. Uh, it tends to have some crossover often into what we call the mythos, which is to say this idea of pre-human races and pre-human mythologies uh, and magics. Uh, the phrase swords and sorcery. Uh, was coined by Michael Moorcock. Uh, many people know Michael Moorcock of Elric and, and Stormbringer fame, uh, Hawkmoon, and, and you know a number of other franchises, literary franchises. Um, he coined the phrase in the 60s, I believe, uh, when somebody asked him, how would you characterize the works of Robert E. Howard? Robert E. Howard, the creator of Conan. And he said, well, if I had to characterize the works of Robert E. Howard, I'd call it swords and sorcery. Uh, and this is how I make the case in, in a presentation I give, uh, Texas, home of swords and sorcery, that Texas is, in fact, uh, where swords and sorcery originated. Um, as my t-shirt shows, this is a picture of the Robert E. Howard House in Cross Plains, Texas. Uh, Robert E. Howard was inspired uh, by the terrain uh, and, and history and uh, geology of, of Texas to create Samaria. Uh, the homeland of Conan, and and he drew upon the history and geography of New Mexico and Texas and the American Southwest uh, heavily uh, in his writing. Uh, so that's what swords and sorcery is to me. It's a uh, uh, a homegrown uh, Texas uh, form of fantasy, even though most people don't think of it that way. Uh, and it is a sort of gritty, dark, uh, low-level, character-driven uh, kind of um, fantasy. Cool. And uh, Clint, what does swords and sorcery mean to you? Well, I think that actually covers it pretty well. Um, to me, uh, we talked about this a little bit uh, in posts on the uh, on the site leading up to the show, but I think, to me, sword and sorcery as a genre 
uh, is defined by a relative lack of sorcery and a relative reliance on swords. Uh, not that sorcery isn't present, but that it's present often as the 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 the, the thing that's used by the villain or uh, or by its scarcity uh, or by its uh, uh, by the nature of it being difficult to cast, painful or or um, uh, or uh, debilitating to cast, and often appears uh, off screen, as it were. Um, so, good point. And how about you, Brendan? Yeah. So, uh, swords and sorcery it takes into account people's personal feelings and personal problems in a way that other fantasy genres don't. Uh, in a swords and sorcery. A novel or, or game or whatever, uh, the focus of the story may very well be that the hero has a bum knee, uh, whereas that would probably never even be brought up in a uh, high fantasy story like maybe The Lord of the Rings or whatever. Well, that, that might even be enough to drive the story uh, in, 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 in a certain case. And the point of swords and sorcery is to... Uh, Make it feel like you're not only watching a train wreck, but also a rider on on that train wreck. Because you get to know this character, you get yep. to you you try to identify a little bit, even though it's a it's a foreign setting. You try to identify a little bit with the problems that they're having because who's never had a sore back before or something like that, or who's who's never uh, you know been a little strapped for cash before, right? You know, Example. Right. So I find it is a lot more relatable. Good, good swords and sorcery, uh, even though they are, you know, burly people swinging swords or villains with magic, or whatever. It's a lot more relatable to common people than other fantasy genres are. I think so. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad, and I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, it's you know. You, you know, you sympathize with these characters because you know what it's like to need a few extra bucks, and I think that is something that that's a big difference uh, for me between swords and sorcery and other kinds of fantasy, particularly high fantasy. Is in swords and sorcery, I would say a little bit more than half the time, the protagonists in swords and sorcery stories are are motivated by money. Sure. They, they they either they either need the money because they need to eat just like everybody else. Or right. you know they need the money because they want to show how awesome they are at, at beating people up and taking their stuff, or their or how cunning they are. Right. And it's either women or it's money, right? It, very often, it, yes. It's, and, it's and, something and, very base in any event. Right. Something that and, is and not going to be the motivation uh, in higher heroic fantasy. Yeah. yeah, and and with you know with with high fantasy, uh, it it is almost inevitable if you're reading a work of high fantasy that what's at stake is the fate of the world. The world is going to end. The world is going to be remade. The world is going to be changed in some massive fundamental way. And in in general, in swords and sorcery, that is rarely, if ever, the case. And in fact, I off the top of my head, I can only think of one swords and sorcery story where the world itself is at stake. Um, right. You know, it, it's just you know the, the the hero doesn't care about crossing the world and throwing something into a volcano to stop some evil necromancer from taking over the world. If he wants to kill the necromancer, even if the necromancer is trying to take over the world, it's probably just out of revenge. Probably the necromancer crossed him, and nobody yeah. crosses the the blind swordsman or whoever your character is. Right, right, right. right. Or he says, "I'm not going to mess with that necromancer." Or he ends up taking a pouch of gold from the necromancer. Uh, I mean, there could be any any number of connections, but chances are, uh, and and this is something that I mentioned uh, uh, last week when we started talking about swords and sorcery toward the end of our uh, talk. Um, to me, that is the the uh, biggest uh, thematic difference between high fantasy and swords and sorcery. That in high fantasy, you the author tries to sell you on the idea of the mission. Uh, I mean, Tolkien Tolkien is deliberately uh, presenting you with characters who are nobodies. This is right. what he's doing. He's right, and and I know that you know Tolkien fans who don't actually uh, understand history will object to this. But what Tolkien's doing is he's writing a metaphor for World War II. He's saying you British people who live in in your little tiny brick houses with your little tiny gardens, you're nobodies. Uh, but this this great darkness of Nazism is spreading across the world, and you as nobodies need to step up and go stop it. 
That's who Frodo is. That's who Bilbo is. These are nobodies. These are not heroes. These are people who have heroic acts thrust upon them because there is a greater mission. So high fantasy is very mission-driven. You've got to care about the mission, then you care about the characters peripherally. Well, as Brendan was talking about in, in, in Swords and Sorcery, you get sold on the idea of the character, uh, right. and you worry about the character's aches and pains and fears and motivations. And then because you care about the character, you care about whatever their mission is. Survive. Pay the rent. Fill my belly. Uh, hook up with that hot red-headed chick in the chainmail bikini. Whatever. Uh, the, the mission is complete. Swords and Sorcery is very nihilistic. Uh, on right. some level, because ultimately the hero survives, he doesn't survive, he succeeds, he doesn't succeed, the world's not going to change. Usually a good, about a good mission for a swords and sorcery uh, hero is one in which they break even. You know? Yeah, that's something that is is very common in swords and sorcery. Uh, the, the protagonists don't always win and often they can lose, but it's right. still a satisfying story. You know how how many Conan the Barbarian stories end where where like Conan's just surrounded by destruction and he just decides screw it and he moves on. Right. <laughs> and very often, where from one story to the next, you have a reset, right? Nothing where things happen during the story, but then at the beginning of the next story, again he starts out br drunk and broke or uh, or something like that. You know, like the Alfred and the Grey Mouser stories over and over again. They'll accomplish something. But by the end of the by the end of the next story, by the end of the story, and then by the beginning of the next story, they're back at square one, uh, right. trying trying to figure out how the hell to make rent. Right. Yeah, it's all, it's all very easy come, easy go. So many of the, the the good, happy endings of sword and sorcery stories are written in such a way where you know this this victory, this high point is fleeting, and it is going to pass, and there'll be another adventure somewhere down the road. Well, and, and often the happy ending of a swords and sorcery story is very much a happy ending in, in the sense that uh, <laughs> that phrase is sometimes used. And as we all know, that is a very a very fleeting thing. It is a happy ending. Uh, but it's not uh, an ultimate or, or, or final ending. It's, it's just the ending of this episode. And you know what? I think this is why I would venture to say that most um, fantasy role-playing games really draw on swords and sorcery much, 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 much more than high fantasy uh, than people would think. Sure, yeah. indeed, you've got orcs and elves and all the things that you have out of Tolkien, but the actual storylines are very Conan, very Elric, very, very Fafford and Grey Mouser, very right. Kugel the Clever. You know, Mike, um, since, I'll make, I'll make a, good, a good example of that um, from, from a game that I ran yesterday. So uh, this party, uh, without going into too many details, so I don't want to bore everybody, but this party is going to this temple, right? Uh, they were told to go to this temple by a priestess who... Uh, belonged to this uh, this order. Uh, they all worshipped Poseidon. So they go to this temple, Poseidon, and they all go in there, and they break into this inner sanctum by solving a puzzle, and the thing that they were told to re retrieve in this inner sanctum wasn't there. It just right. didn't exist. <laughs> um, the priestess belonged to a cult, one that was opposed to Poseidon, and uh, she played them. She didn't know the ritual necessary to get into this inner sanctum, and it was enchanted to keep her out. They opened the door, she was in, and uh, what they ended up doing uh, as they were fighting her is blow up this temple. Uh, this temple was under the water. Uh, it had sunk in an earthquake and was holding out all of this water, and uh, one of the characters had bombs, blew up something that was structurally important, the whole thing collapsed, filled with water, it was all destroyed. So, so what happened? Did they get the treasure that they were looking to get? No, they didn't get that. Uh, the person who gave them the quest, she wasn't an ally, she was, she was a villain, okay? So they don't have someone they can go back to to cash in, in, their, cash in their quest for. So, nope, they don't have that either. Um, the, uh, there was a ghost in there, uh, who was, uh, uh, he's a, a dead, uh, paladin of Poseidon. Uh, did they help this dead pal paladin of Poseidon? No, there was a bit of a misunderstanding there. They exercised him. <laughs> so, the, 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 the cleric of Poseidon in the party exercised a paladin of Poseidon. So, he's gone. 
So there wasn't that. Literally, there was nothing redeeming that this party did at all. Uh, right. The only thing that ended up happening was, well, they all survived, uh, and now they have a reason to exact revenge on this uh, priestess. So uh, that that was a, a adventure that, while not maybe typical of all D&D adventures, is probably typical of many of them, and that is 100% swords and sorcery. There is no high fantasy there whatsoever. Buffoonery and error uh, are are uh, much more easily forgiven in swords and sorcery right. uh, than than in high fantasy. The characters that are just kind of buffoons and say, "Ah, well, you know, we did the best we could." They're not the heroes of of of, of high fantasy. Right. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it's about time we got into some of our uh, questions and comments from our viewers. Uh, first one is from David Paul Lehman, who wants to know, how do you set the atmosphere for Swords and Sorcery campaign? Uh, and I, do, doing a lot of LARPing, I love, I love creating scenes and really establishing settings. So if I'm running a tabletop game and I really want to drive home that it's Swords and Sorcery, there's a, a couple of things I, I, that I do. Starting out with the most simplest thing, uh, is just having some neat music. Uh, in a lot of the best swords and sorcery, there's always this this hint of the exotic. Uh, so so many swords and sorcery so, uh, stories are focused on characters that are in a land that isn't their own. Uh, and so what I often do is I will try to find uh, music that sounds uh, that sounds kind of vaguely Middle Eastern. Uh, uh, vaguely, you know, uh, like the in Indian subcontinent, uh, sitar music, that kind of thing, uh, and have that playing in the background. Because when I when I imagine sword and sorcery heroes like entering entering the city of thieves or whatever, that's the music that plays in my head, and so that's the music that I want uh, my players to hear is that kind of vaguely Middle Eastern uh, music. Uh, then getting more complicated than that. Something I've done before is the character sheets. I had all the character sheets written out by hand on fake parchment paper, which hadn't just been aged, it had been messed up. Uh-huh. One of the parchment papers actually had a ring on it where a wine glass had been set down on it. So it looked like a treasure map that had stayed on a tavern table too long. We had one where I actually pinned it to a piece of wood with a knife so that it would have this perfect little knife hole. And, and so they just it, they felt like sheets of, of parchment that a, that a sword and sorcery hero might have on their person. And then the last thing, uh, and this is uh, the one that's the most one you want to be careful with, uh, if you is is do candle lighting, but don't just set up a candelabra. Don't set up tea lights. Get a whole bunch of different candles and just have them all over the like have them kind of clustered in the middle of the table. Uh, and make sure that all the candles are different lengths. Uh, if you can get away with this with your table, have one candle that's just on the table and half melted on it. Have a couple of candles sticking up out of wine bottles. Like make it look like the kind of candles you would have in the tavern where you're worried that at any moment you're going to be knifed in the back or the guards are going to come in and get you. That's cool, Well, uh, how, yeah. how about you, Clint? How do you build that atmosphere? Well, um, I think actually before you get to atmosphere, I think you have to define your terms. Uh, what the, we've, just, we've just explained what we see as sword and sorcery, and we've taken about 25 minutes overall to do it effectively. And uh, I think that it's important for your players and the GM to know what we're talking about with sword and sorcery, because it does mean different things to different people, right? And so I think, as with any game, you have to sort of lay out right, right, flat on the table what the what you what you mean by sword and sorcery and what you expect from the players to make sure that they're on board with it, uh, because. Uh, we are all big fans of sword and sorcery, but I I know a lot of people that I game with, who that you know their their beginning they began with Tolkien and they and they started reading Shannara and the other clones of Tolkien and and that kind of stuff and you know Robert E Howard is a di- kind of a dirty word for them, uh, as strange yeah. as that seems to me, but uh, so I think it's important that everybody is aware of what's going to be happening. Uh, so that you don't have people expecting to go off and save the world and, uh, at, at third level, you know. Good point. That's 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 yeah. well put. Yeah. That doesn't exactly answer your atmosphere question, but it sets the stage in order for you to to get into atmosphere and setting. So. So, um, 
before I get into you know beginning a, a low fantasy swords and sorcery campaign setting, um, I bring the focus story wise to all of the characters, right? Uh, what their motivations are, right. who they are, where they're from, uh, and and the problems that they're having in their personal lives. So I like to start it off there, just just to to set. Uh, the mood and, and the and the ambiance, uh, you know, story wise for for that particular game, but then what I think ends up driving home a, a swords and sorcery setting is the danger level. So I'll throw my characters yeah. in to a situation where somebody low level. You know, someone who doesn't carry much status in the world that they're about to play in, a guard, a bartender, um, a, a bouncer, a, a, some brigands, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Someone who, in, in a high fantasy setting, would be killed with a, a swipe or two of a sword, have them promptly kick my player character's ass. Or near to it, just to establish just the danger level in the setting that they're playing in. That way, they understand that well. This is grittier. This is more dangerous, and this is darker because if minions can be cut away very quickly, then people aren't worrying about their characters nonstop. And if they're not worrying about their characters nonstop, then it's not character driven anymore it becomes mission-driven, right? And as we've established before, and if you can agree with the definition that we laid out in the beginning of the show, that it's, it needs to be character-driven in order for it to be an effective swords and sorcery story, then you need to make sure that every moment your players are worried about the livelihood of their characters, the health of their characters, mm -hmm. uh, and and even the moral, moral ramifications of what their characters are doing. And uh, how about you, uh, Mike? Any uh, specific tips for building that atmosphere? Well, you're you're more of a showman than me, Will. So I have to admit, uh, once in a while, I'll use some kind of a prop, like a map done out on a piece of parchment or something. But I do almost none of the tactile or audio uh, or lighting kind of things that you're talking about. I really don't do any of that at all. Uh, but, uh, you know, I speak professionally, I write professionally, so I fall more back on my words and on, on description for, for, for setting the atmosphere. Uh, but the atmosphere I go for uh, is a lot of what Brendan's talking about. Um, a sense of vulnerability, uh, maybe not a sense of constant peril and constant danger, but certainly vulnerability. Uh, a, a sense that your character is not omnipotent. Uh, a sense that uh, when they go into dangerous situations, that they're that they they're, they're constantly imperiled. And I really like to give a sense in my game for, and I think this ties in with the themes of swords and sorcery. At least it does in my games. A sense of of, of decay uh, of a very very uh, of the characters adventuring. Um, in, in a very, very old place, a very, very old world where a lot has happened before them uh, and give a lot of, of, of signs uh, uh, and, and indication of that. So decay, vulnerability, uh, and fallibility. Uh, and this is something that we reflect in our games, fallibility, with the concept of defects. Will, you and I are the primary authors of the Jester Dragon's Guide to Defects. Uh, and in the D20 system, the Pathfinder system, uh, these are basically anti-feats. One of these. Well, I happen to have the book right here. Yeah, I happen to have a, uh, the book right there. But I think this gives a sense that the characters are very, very human and 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 are frail. So you might have a character who is prone to cold. Uh, they're just susceptible to cold. Cold susceptibility. That's a defect. Uh, you might have a character uh, who has trouble throwing things very well. Uh, you might have a character who's illiterate, who isn't usually illiterate. Uh, so so and, and and those are not options in our games. I remember our, our good friend Ho, uh, Brendan knows Ho. He sat down with me and, and I'd said at the beginning of the game, I said, everybody has to pick a defect for their character. You can be fat or obese, those are defects. Uh, you can be missing a hand, uh, you can be prone to disease. I mean everybody in real life has defects. We've all got defects, right? Um, uh, and I said, you've got to pick a defect, and if you do, I'll give you a bonus feat. And he said, he said, you know, Mike, I've thought about my character, and 
my character concept is such that my character doesn't have any defects. He doesn't have any defects, uh, so I'm just not going to pick one. I said, well, that's fine. You don't have to pick one. I'm just, I'm just going to get out these dice, and I'm going to roll one randomly for you, and you're going to take that defect for your character, and you don't get an offsetting feat for it. Just give me a minute. I'll sort this out. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, characters have got to have some sort of frailty, and they don't always have to be visible. It doesn't mean the characters are uh, look uh, necessarily show their defect. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we've got one that's Aura of Despair, and basically it's just the character that just drags everybody else down. You know, she's just always sighing and moaning, and everybody's just, you know, just, just dragged down. We put this into game terms. Uh, so, so yeah, so the vulnerability, uh, fallibility, and peril, these are all things that I try to build into the atmosphere for a Swords and Sorcery game. Now, we've got another question here. It's a very good one uh, from uh, Rolando Yanez, who wants to know, is swords and sorcery inherently sexist? Uh, I'm going to say no. I don't think it's any more or less inherently sexist than any other form of storytelling. Uh, there is just... But sadly, there is a like year's worth of, of sexist material between between chainmail bikinis and uh, and uh, half naked princesses clinging to the thighs of, of iron thewed warriors and, and things like that. And you know, sometimes that stuff is kind of body good fun, and sometimes it is just you know out, outright sexist and objectifying. But I, I you know I think the thing is to look for the sword and sorcery if if the, if Look for the sword and sorcery that that isn't sexist. One of my absolute favorite sword and sorcery stories is Queen of the Black Coast by Robert E. Howard. And one of the things I loved about that story is during the course of this story, Conan the Barbarian joins forces with this pirate named Belit, who is a woman who is every bit Conan's equal. She can drink just as hard as Conan. She can fight just as hard as Conan. They are a perfect match, and they lay waste to the coastal cities of Kush. And it's 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 probably as close to a romantic story as any Conan story gets, uh, but being that it's a Conan story, because he's falling in love with her, she does have to die at the end. Ah, natural. But, but up but until that has, point, I mean, it's a great story with with a, a great character. But who owns the pirate fleet? Uh, actually, I believe Belit does. I believe it is her show. Uh, yeah, Conan's like her her, her lieutenant. That's he right. starts as her prisoner, but then she, you know he proves how valuable he is on that crew. Right, but she's the one with the power to begin with. That's right. Which is yeah. cool. And, I mean, you have to keep in mind, uh, anytime you, you do a, a, a gritty, low-level kind of story where, where human interests are, are involved, if you're trying to be true to uh, the setting that you're trying to paint of a barbarian male... Uh, just taking Conan as an example. We don't have to take Conan ex as an example, but I will in this case. Just taking Conan as, as an example, he's a, a muscular male barbarian. Uh, this story is about his personal interests. What are his personal interests? I'm sure they're somewhat sexist. Right. So, yeah, uh, the, the story is going to come out a bit sexist because of the kind of character that you have. Right, uh, you know, if we if we if we look back in our history, several hundred years, uh, Europe was full of raping and pillaging. It was a pretty sexist place. So, but at, at the same time, uh, if if your story were uh, about a woman, it wouldn't necessarily be sexist. It would be about her interests, right? right. So it's it's really a matter of of the perspective that uh, and and the main character that your your story revolves around. I think. Uh, there's nothing inherently sexist about it. It's just that human beings, when you get down to their base desires, are pretty crappy. <laughs> and and, and I, 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 I think that a lot of the early swords and sorcery is sexist. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. One um, is because of the era it came out of. So sure. it came out of uh, the 1930s, uh, where people really did have a different way of looking at things. Two, and I say this as someone who's a Texan, I live in Texas, uh, it is a sexist culture uh, to some extent. I mean, most of our political leaders down here are right-wing Republicans uh, who don't believe in uh, the individual rights of women, economic or, or, or medical or anything, and yet women uh, still vote, vote for these guys. 
so this is this is a, a a certain set of values that that people have. The woman who votes for a guy who says, "I think you should get paid half as much as a man," is uh, the slave girl that will cling to a barbarian's leg. It's the same. It's the same character. Uh, different circumstances. Different eras. So it is not that that it is inherently sexist. It's that uh, people's own sexism gets um, superimposed over it. Um, but I've read a lot of uh, swords and sorcery that is not sexist, and my own swords and sorcery, like Necropolis uh, or Hecaton, which you contributed to, um, guys, um, that uh, shows a lot of different gender roles uh, than what you often see in traditional swords and sorcery. So it certainly doesn't have to be, and I personally try to break away from that. Yeah, Necropolis has a lot of the uh, the byplay between both genders uh, in a much more uh, modern way than than some of the older stuff. So that that's absolutely right, Mike. Having having read Necropolis, you do you do, do that, yeah. And if you're playing at a table where both genders are represented, it can't be. Yeah, well, that's right. You know, I mean, there there's nothing inherently sexist about sword and sorcery, and if you have women playing at the same table as you, then you can't let it be. Yeah. That's cool. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, that, that goes back to what we've always been saying. Don't be a creep. Don't do things that make people feel unwelcome at your game. Absolutely. Make sure everyone has fun. Don't play with dicks. <laughs> Don't play with dicks. That's what we always say. That's what we always say. We always say. Don't play with dicks. Don't play with dicks. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this is a question that's actually just uh, kind of uh, coming from me personally, because I really want to know what you guys think. Uh, how do you guys like to handle the sorcery in your sword and sorcery? Who asked I mean, do, that? Do you, like, do you just like to leave the magic in the hands of, of the villains? Do you like it to be big and flashy or creepy and subtle? And... Thr Thrasher asked that, Mike. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, he wants to know. It's a good question, though. That's just my own curiosity. Yeah, it's a good question. Um... <laughs> I'll jump right into it if you guys don't mind. Not at all. Okay, so um, I I actually fell in love with the concept of swords and sorcery uh, style games that are sort of dark, gritty, and dangerous without even really knowing it. Um, I started developing a, uh, a a game system that very much evolved into that, uh, the Swords of Infinity game system. Um and, you know, as I started working out the rules for magic, uh, what I ended up with something was something that was powerful, uh, generally required a lot of sacrifice or help to, uh, to achieve big results, mm -hmm. and uh, had, had the threat of great bodily harm uh, to the caster themselves. So I, I ended up deciding that, you know what, that, that ended up fitting very well with the swords and sorcery uh, kind of genre because I think that magic is, is an option of last resort in, in, those, kinds of, uh, in those kinds of stories. It's, it's effectively your trope of making a deal with the devil, right? It's this, this otherworldly power that you're calling on uh, you don't. No one really understands it super well. The people who practice it, uh, you know, they they tend to sequester themselves away from from the, the rest of society and and are are always considered oddballs, oddballs, and and somewhat weird. I mean, Ningalbul has seven eyes. Yeah, only six of which you ever get to see. That's right. And so, Kilda has an eyeless face. And, yeah, exactly. He has an eyeless face. These are these are strange people, and yeah. these these are practitioners of of magic. Um, I mean, this was a, a comment I made on on, on, on the Facebook page. Is uh, I mean, if we're talking about Fafford and the Great Mauser, the magic there uh, it seems coincidental, right? Uh, the in the very first story, uh, in in the origin story of of the Great Mauser. I'm sorry, not the Great Mauser. Fafford, rather. He comes right. from this village up north, and the wise women are casting a spell. Right. Uh, the spell makes ice build up on the roof of this building where the men are having a somewhat raunchy good time, and it causes the roof to collapse. Well, was that just because the weather was bad, or was it actually because of the spell? You don't really know. But right. it's, 
He's and very obtuse. Lieber that's right. Obtuse. It's subtle. It, it's it's somewhat co coincidental, and and I think it it needs to be dark. I mean, the Mauser in that same origin story, in his own origin story, casts a spell to protect himself from from an evil wizard that almost kills him. Right. Um, so I, I think in order to get that right, magic needs to be rare, misunderstood, and dangerous. Yeah, I'm. I am glad you ta have talked about magic being being dangerous. So that's whenever, whenever I, whenever I take something like Pathfinder and want to run a swords and sorcery campaign with it, I always tweak the magic rules so that there's some risk associated with the magic. It's not fire and forget. It's not it does work or it doesn't. Yeah. I like it when something can go wrong, uh, and and actually the Faffer and the Grey Mauser series are are full of that. There's a uh, Lords of Quarmall. There's this great scene where the Grey Mauser has this scroll, uh, and that's right. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know the the guy he's working for is like, well, you know, I've got this scroll. It might help me defeat your brother's cadre of wizards. So he goes, okay. Yeah. So he lays down the scroll and like does this three hour chant. Right. And when he looks up, he realizes that the spell he cast. Didn't just didn't just curse the the brothers wizards. It killed every magic user within three miles of the scroll. Right, right. They all died. And it's completely unexpected. <laughs> and it screws over both sides because now neither side has its wizards. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Fafford's working as a mercenary for one side of the and the mouse for the other. That's I, right. In, in my stories, um, I actually uh, I. In my fan, my fantasy feels very, very D and D in a lot of ways because a lot of my fantasy is deliberately written to feel like a D and D game session. I mean, that is something that I've deliberately tried to do because I think a lot of the official uh, D and D literature doesn't really do that. They've said, "Oh, well, here's our D and D world, and here's our uh, uh, our fiction line," and and you don't really feel that that connect with them. So what I've tried to do is is really in my fantasy. Um, uh, it's it's tribute fantasy in a way. So people in my fantasy world have a superstition. We we don't define whether it's really based on reality or not, but they have a superstition that the ideal adventuring party is made up of four people. If there if you need a small group of people to go in and do something, you should have one that's skilled at arms. You should have one that wields some sort of divine power. You should have one that's a wizard with arcane power, and uh, you should have one that's stealthy or roguelike. And then there's all sorts of complicated conditions whereby you could have a fifth person who doesn't really fit into any of these categories. Uh, this is what the characters believe. So whether wizards are as prevalent throughout the game world as fighters is irrelevant. In the context of an adventure, there's going to be an equal number of wizards and fighters because this is what the characters believe they need to do to succeed. That if they've got three fighters and one wizard, they don't have the right proportions uh, to their to their party. Uh, so this is something that, that, that I reflect, and, and that's a gameism. It's a gameism that I've said, okay, what if people really believe this? Uh, how would it play out in, in the real world? Uh, so so uh, I'd like to have uh, magic backfire and have things go wrong too, uh, but pretty much the magic I'm reflecting in my games is the magic pretty much straight out of the game system. How about you, Clint? Well, I think for sword and sorcery, for me... Uh, magic has to be less utilitarian and more uh, more dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, in D&D, there's a spell that will allow you to do just about everything. And that's not something that you typically see in sword and sorcery. S uh, the magic in sword and sorcery is deadly and dangerous to the caster and to the people that are around them and to the target. But it doesn't allow you to zot, the door is open, or zap, I... Sure. I magically shrunk that thing so I can stick it in my pack, right? It's, right. It tends to be more ritual, and mm -hmm. it tends to be more directed at a particular goal, but the goal is generally a simple one and not a utilitarian one, if you mm -hmm. know what I mean. I'm going to curse that guy. I'm not going to figure out a way to teleport into his sanctum. It's more right. general, a more general effect. Yeah, yeah, in Lords of Cormall, they're uh, trying to give each other cancer and and right. herpes and uh, and uh, AIDS all at the same time, so that they they die. In fact, uh, 
That does happen, doesn't it? One of them, yeah, his, when his wizards die, he's not protected anymore. So he, he catches, like, five different horrible diseases and turns into this green goo. Yeah, he turns into a green goo, but his will is so strong, it, he won't let himself That's die. Right. So That's he's right. a disembodied voice following around a puddle of vaguely anthropoid goo being carried around on a palaquin by, uh, by four slaves. That's right. That's right. He could still talk. It was, it was absurd. And, you know, that's you, you mentioned this. I realized how much we're cracking up talking about this. There is just, in general, much more humor in sword yeah. and sorcery than in high fantasy. Yeah. And it's all yeah. kinds of humor. It's farce. It's body humor. It's right. comedies of misunderstanding, gallows yeah. humor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much. It's what Brendan said. It's much more approachable to the mere mortal. Right. Uh, it is not transcendent. Uh, you don't feel that some greater thing is being accomplished, uh, but it feels much more human and approachable. Yep. Yeah. Well, we are. We we've had a really good discussion. I did want to. I did want to go over uh, one other thing. Uh, if we could all just you know talk about our our favorite examples of of sword and sorcery. Uh, and I guess I'll I'll go ahead and head and start because we could probably do a whole show on this, so we might as well just get it out of the way. I know I've talked a lot about Robert E. Howard. I've talked a lot about uh, about Fritz Lieber and and you know Lynn Carter, Michael Moorcock. But I think when it comes down to it, my favorite example of swords and sorcery is Thundar the Barbarian. <laughs> You've got a barbarian with a possibly magical, possibly alien weapon. He does not know anything about, but he knows how to use it. Uh, a a monster and a princess with limited magical powers riding through a post-apocalyptic wasteland, defeating evil wizards, uh, <laughs> evil sorcerers, and evil evil scient evil mad scientists that, that have magic. It's just like a perfect collision of everything I love in Sword and Sorcery. Yeah, a post-apocalyptic wasteland that repeats periodically. It's well, on occasion. Era post-apocalyptic wasteland. It's very Flintstones post-apocalyptic <laughs> wasteland. I always love it with with awesome character designs by Jack Kirby, though. And I yeah. just I just love that opening narration. In 1994, a rogue planet comes tearing through the solar system. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I don't know, how how about you, Brendan? Well, I I think probably as often as I as I referenced uh, Fafford and the Grey Mauser, it probably gives it away. Yeah, definitely my my favorite uh, swords and sorcery uh, series. Probably probably similar for a lot of people. Conan is always always solid, always good. Uh, pretty pretty decent, enjoyable movie adaptations as well. So uh, that's that's the up, upside to that. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, how about you, Mike? Uh, well, I'll just read very quickly the dedication uh, to Necropolis, which sums it up. Uh, it's the only book where I've ever dedicated uh, the book to um, uh, fictional characters rather than real people. Uh, and I write, to Fritz Lieber's Fafford and the Grey Mouser, Jack Vance's Kugel the Clever, Robert E. Howard's Conan, and all the other den dungeon delving rogues who have inspired swords and sorcery adventures like this one. So, so it, I overlap with Brendan a lot on that. It is Lieber. Uh, it is um, uh, Howard. Uh, and then uh, for me, Vance. Uh, you, you can't have swords and sorcery uh, without Vance uh, because Kugel the Clever is really, in a lot of ways, uh, just the you know the ultimate fox-faced rogue. Uh, so, so um, yeah. Uh, I, I would say those three authors and their quintessential characters. And how about you, Clint? Well, all of those uh, I I truly enjoyed as a kid, and still I go reread them as often as I can. Uh, but I, moving outside of those for the moment, I have two that have been long-standing favorites of mine. Uh, first is Carl Edward Wagner's Kane, uh, which I really enjoyed the his novellas and short stories about that. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the things that we hadn't talked about is the anti-hero, who is a stock character in Sword and Sorcery, but does not really enter into epic or uh, high fantasy as, as, as admirably as well, anyway, as he does uh -huh. in Sword and Sorcery. And I think Kane is a terrific example of that, and a really uh -huh. great 
character. Uh, so those are those are great, uh, and I also really enjoyed Lawrence Watt Evans' uh, Lords of Dus uh, uh, set of four books. Uh, uh, Garth the Overman um, is the uh, the lead character for that, and they are a very sword and sorcery, um, and uh, also have a fairly significant mythos connection. So uh, the uh, the wizard that he's uh, working for is essentially the king in yellow. Uh, ah, so. nice. Uh, so those are those are my recommendations. If people haven't read them, then get off the interwebs and go read them. And, and you know what? That's it. That's what it boils down to. Uh, I had this this horrible epiphany a few years ago at Gen Con where somebody said, you know, I kept hearing people say, you know, Cthulhu's cool, and I love this and I love that. And then you would talk to these people, even people who play in our games, Will, they've never actually read Lovecraft. They've never yeah. read Clark Ashton Smith. They've never read August Derleth. I mean, uh, they, they never they don't read. Uh, so they think these things are cool, uh, and it just, you know, maybe I'm making too much of it, but it just it just kind of bugs me. Uh, you know, it's just sort of the ultimate imposerism to think something's cool but not have the mental discipline to read a, a, a short story uh, that talks about that, that all that wonderful coolness. They're not even that long. The subject material isn't even very long. It would take you. It would take you maybe an afternoon. You could kill a beer in the amount of time it takes you to read one of these things. You could do it at the same time. So, yeah, it's like Lovecraft has two novellas, three serialized long fiction pieces, and everything else is short stories, poems, and prose. Exactly. Yep. And they're not hard, and thankfully they're not hard to find anymore. Uh, yeah, that, that's they're all online because they're all uh, they're all public domain. Yeah, yeah, very, very we're true. Publishing that shit now. That's right. <laughs> well, gentlemen, we have had a wonderful discussion on swords and sorcery, so I think it's about time we did our final thoughts uh, before sign off. And uh, my own final thought is just, if, if you're going to do sword and sorcery, uh, keep it thrilling, keep it dangerous, keep it a little bit violent and brutal, uh, and, and, every now and every now and then disturb your players with the magic that your antagonists are going to use, whether that means sacrifices or weird shadowed ape-like things summoned from the nether reaches. Uh, Brandon, final thoughts? Well, uh, my my swords and sorcery quest is going to be uh, Comic Palooza coming up next weekend. Uh, making sure that 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 all goes off without a hitch. The world won't end if it doesn't, but uh, if it, if it goes on well, then at least I will be happy. I will be using uh, you know whatever sorcery I have available to me to to make all of our our websites and stuff support what we're going to be doing. So. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, the, you IT guys are the new wizards. Well, that's right. I, I, I am effectively a, a modern-day sorcerer. And uh, here, here's your sword. Right. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> that's all for me. <laughs> Uh, Mike, your final thoughts. Uh, I, I would just like to note that this being D Infinity Live, I'd like to let our listeners know that D Infinity Volume Number Six, so uh, D Infinity Magazine. Here's a copy of Volume Four, for example. D Infinity Magazine went to print yesterday, uh, so it will be released in print uh, at Comic Palooza next Friday. Anyone who's at Comic Palooza gets first look at print editions of it. It's 80 pages, and it's just a beautiful issue. It's got a couple great articles by you, Will, including one on prop prop building, uh, Innsmouth Gold, how to take uh, the Innsmouth Gold from Lovecraft story and actually create props that look like Innsmouth Gold. It's got a great digital dice article by uh, Brendan on phone apps that can be used in conjunction with games. Clint has got his chevauchee rules he was talking about, and a terrific piece of um, swords and sorcery fiction, uh, which has just uh, got one of the most stirring battle scenes, truthfully, that I've ever read in any uh, swords and sorcery. I mean, it just put shivers up my spine when I read it. And, of course, it has all sorts of wonderful things by me in it. Uh, and that'll be out in PDF format um, as soon as we can get it out in PDF format uh, in a couple of days, hopefully by Tuesday. That'll be available for people who can't be to Comic Palooza. So check out the Infinity Volume Number Six, The Mythos. Very cool. And Clint, as our special guest, the final final thought goes to you. Well, I would like to suggest to people that if they're if they've never tried a uh, a low magic game, 
or if they're thinking about it, uh, sword and sorcery is the perfect genre to do that in. Um, especially with the with low numbers and and power of magic items. If you're tired of, of giving people a golf bag full of swords, then go sword and sorcery for a while. And my final thought is that hopefully when we all get back from Comic Palooza, our next adventure will start with us broke and hungover. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it goes. <laughs> Although, although you, you never know, one one of us might have the broken off hand of a gold idol, and it'll be cursed, but we'll have it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that has been D Infinity Live Swords and Sorcery uh, for myself, William Big T Thrasher, for Michael Jolly Varhola, for Brandon Less Jolly Cass, and for Clint Staples. This not, has been not jolly at all. Not jolly at all. He, not, he's not. transcended jollyhood. But this has been D Infinity Live. We will oh actually we will see you next week for a very special episode, which will be coming to you live uh, as we are setting up for Comic Palooza. Yeah, and then a special extra show on Sunday during Comic Palooza. Bonus episode. <laughs> Alright, so we will see you all this time next week. <laughs>